being forced to be at home now, it forces us to actually see what has always been there, but we've been avoiding it or not having to look at it. And so here it is. Hello and welcome back. I will be your host. My name is Christopher Carter. I'm a coach for founders and executives and meditation teacher for organizations. This Epic Life podcast explores three permissions. How's it going out there? One of the many, many gifts that 2020 is giving us is the inability to escape from the work that we need to be doing on ourselves and maybe in our own home and in our relationships. Today's guest was such a true gift of a find to have some of these deeper conversations around questions like, what's important? What deepens our lives? What does it mean to be human? As a teacher and practitioner of nonviolent communication, Rochelle Lamb has devoted over 40 years to these questions. I discovered Rochelle's body of work while doing research for my book, and I was compelled to leave her a message that same morning. It was really inspiring to find someone so committed to creating global social change, but by working on a very personal level with individuals. These themes are ever-present in our lives this year as we navigate issues like the pandemic, political division, and the impact of climate change. Tackling complex and emotionally charged topics often begins in our homes and around our tables. What struck me about Rochelle is her balance between gentle compassion and unwavering strength. There's a quote that I use a lot in the coaching of executives and leaders, and it's a quote from Swami Sri Yukteswar. He was the guru of my teacher, Paramahansa Yogananda. I guess you could call him my Param guru. The quote is, Gentle as the flower where kindness is concerned, stronger than the thunder when principles are at stake. Our world needs more kindness and strength, and it gives me hope to find a teacher like Rochelle who is committed to training and embodying both qualities. At the core of nonviolent communication is the practice of a four-step process, first making neutral observations, then identifying our feelings Third, clearly stating our needs, and finally, making a request. Dr. Marshall Rosenberg developed the nonviolent communication framework in the 60s. Rochelle studied with and was certified by Dr. Rosenberg and continues to carry on his work in so many cool ways. Rochelle is a recognized speaker, poet, and relationship whisperer. She draws on a breadth of knowledge and decades of study in subjects like cultural anthropology, history, psychology, mythology, storytelling, and even ecology. In the conversation you're about to hear, pay attention to her ability to look deeply into any area that empowers a more transformational dialogue. If this sounds too intellectual, please remember that all of this is in service of fully seeing and understanding ourselves and whomever we're communicating with. My hope is that we can get more committed to practicing nonviolent communication in our homes, within our teams, and in our communities. This is a huge opportunity to learn the basics, and they absolutely work. Rochelle lives in Victoria, British Columbia, Canada, where she's constantly delivering learning experiences her students call profound and life-changing. Grab a cup of tea, reflect on your most important people in your life, and open your mind and heart. When it comes to expressing our voice from a place of wisdom and love, Rochelle Lamb is a master teacher and student. Our dialogue ranges from the deeply personal to the global. Enjoy this conversation on nonviolent communication and the power and beauty of language to heal just about anything with Rochelle Lamb. So the smoke, when you step outside, you're smelling bits of our our West Coast wafting through the air? Yep, smelling it and tasting it as well. You staying inside more because of it? Yep. It's not a good idea to go outside unless you have to for essentials. But, you know, I'm not a jogger. If I was, I'd be disappointed. But I'm not. So I can can stretch indoors. (laughs) 
Well, we always kick off these conversations with an exploration of the three permissions, but you shared something with me that I found so compelling just before we started rolling, which is that you would question the use of the word permission, or it's not one of your favorite words. And I I really have a respect for your lens on language because you're a poet as well. So um, help me understand the, the challenge you have with the word permission. That word is typically a word that is used in a context that all of us, I believe, are familiar with, and it's the parental child relationship. Sure. And so right there to ask permission is to acknowledge and to say that there's there's a power over relationship here. Mm. And I don't want to uh, encourage a power over relationship within myself, yeah. even though I get where the, the question comes from. You know, what are you, what are you just not doing and you'd like to be doing instead, perhaps something like that. Yeah. But um, it's, it's a question that, that gets asked in, um, in a lot of workshops that I give, not the question you're asking, but something around the word permission. Mm. So for instance, in a relationship, somebody might be doing a role play and saying, I'm talking to my spouse. And then I say to them, would it be okay with you if I, and then they ask something. And right there, I say, look, is that what you're really meaning to do is ask for permission? Because right now you're sounding like the child speaking to a parent. Is that what you're wanting to do? Sure. Yeah. So we want to just equalize the relationship, you know? So even within myself, I tend not to even go there. Use the word? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's not that I'll never use it. It's not like eh, it's forbidden. Right. It's simply, I, I keep it out of, yeah, it just doesn't come up for me. Um, so... So you want to ask me in a different way? Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> this is great because this uh, I'm really present to your evolution, but I'm also uh, present to the opportunity for some of mine. Mm-hmm. I guess another way of, of framing the kind of our launching off point is at its core, this podcast is about full self-expression. Yeah. Finding out what we are here to do, our unique divine fingerprint, how to unleash that into the world what I would call typically permission to glow in the dark, but we will just call it glowing in the dark. These moments that we trip over where we know we're doing what we're here to do. The other two kind of pathways that get us there that I've discovered have been, well, most of the people that hire me want to just skip to the end and just start glowing in the dark. They want to throw a switch and say, okay, I'm here, I'm doing my thing Mm -hmm. and getting paid well for it. My path led me to the other two, which was, to chill, which is to make space and to be with what is, to create stillness, meditation, mindfulness, some some form of stillness. And the other, which is how I found you and your work, which is what I call feel all the feels, uh, to embrace our full humanity uh, without judgment, with full acceptance, ex- accepting it as as is. Do any three of those resonate with you any more than the others today in this moment? I'm going to read a poem to you because oh, it, awesome. it just, <laughs> and let, and then let's see if, if I've managed to capture it because uh, it, this is called the road and hopefully that will reveal the one. And is this your, is this your poem? This is mine. Yes. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. The road will break your heart. One moment exhilarating the next moment, devastating, but always generous, no matter and without prejudice, to cultivate a taste for all of it, to craft beauty from wreckage, to recognize that it too must have its season and become the compost of what's to come. No one of sound mind embraces that, but we are all chosen and a meek and quiet few feel the approaching tide and what it whispers at dawn. They will undo themselves before being forced undone. Naked on the human road, still in love with life and mystery, knowing less and less each day, a songbird lands in their heart to build its nest of longing. Feel all the feels. That was really spot on. I really appreciate you sharing that. That was beautiful. And indirectly, what you did back there was glow in the dark because you're bringing in this magical, seemingly disparate talent and skill for poetry into your work as a teacher, which is 
totally lives inside of feeling all the feels. So uh, mm-hmm. beautiful. Thank you so much for that. So that's the two for one special. <laughs> the two for one. Great. <laughs> Great. Nonviolent communication. I tripped over your work a few weeks ago on Google and I started blowing you up. I called you on the phone. I emailed you and said how much uh, your work meant to me and touched me in the time I found it. I was doing research for my own book. That was a great message, by the way. Thank you for that. It's really <laughs> lovely to get a phone call from somebody, you know, and yeah. expressing themselves in the way you did. It was very generous. <laughs> when something online touches me, I'd prefer to just reach out and put a human voice to it to, so people mm. know, because I know when people find my work in a similar manner, if they let me know, it always means a lot. Like, oh, how did you find it? What resonates? You know, it's great feedback. But um, yeah. that couple days was such a lightning bolt in my um coaching work and in my writing, because I got to know Marshall Rosenberg through your work. Mm-hmm. I, I got to hear some of the uh, past interviews you've done around the topic. And I just feel like this topic around nonviolent communication is something so incredibly vital and important at this moment in history. I could say U.S. history, but it's world history too. It is. Yeah. What was the lightning bolt day for you when you realized that this was a major component of your life's work? Well, that's uh, really easy to answer. At the time, like just uh, in 1999, Marshall Rosenberg was traveling around the world quite a bit. And uh, one of the places he ended up coming to was Victoria. It was the only Canadian place that he came to. And someone had recommended that I read the book, Nonviolent Communication, not because I was violent, <laughs> but sure. hey, you should read this, <laughs> um, but but because of I've always been interested in human relationships and education. It's been like since since I was born. And so I read the book in just a few days. And it was at that point when it ended, I put the book down and I was like, oh, my goodness. You know, I want I want to read more. I want to know more about this. Seemed very powerful to me. And so that's when I I found out that Marshall was actually coming to Victoria Three weeks after I finished reading the book, I signed up for the workshop. There were about 90 people in the room. I remember arriving early, sitting in the front row because I was very intrigued about who is this human being who's saying these things. So I sat there and he was sitting on a stool at the front of the room, jotting down some notes. He was introduced. And the first thing he said to us as we were sitting there was he said, Good morning. What can I do today to make life more wonderful for you? There was something in the manner of his asking that. And he was well into his 60s at that point. And the deep sincerity that Mm -hmm. he had when he asked that question. And people right away started answering, saying, Oh, you can help me to get my child to do their homework. You can help me talk to the person who refused to come to the workshop, but they're the one who should be here or things like that, you Mm -hmm. know? And then we just dug right into it. But literally that day, I was moved to tears. I came home. I came home. My husband was caring for our two children at the time who would have been around uh, seven and 12 years old. And he said to me, "So, so how was the workshop? And I said, I smiled. I was just beaming. I said, it was fantastic. It was so great. And then I just started crying because it felt like something I'd been looking for my whole life. Mm. Because so often in scenarios where, you know, there was conflict between myself and my children or myself and my husband, I didn't know how to respond. I would just like not know what to say. Then suddenly I meet someone who actually has some really great ideas and offerings about what you can say instead of the thing you've always said that has always gotten you into trouble and alienated you more. So it was such a, such a wonderful thing to discover at that moment. You know, when I knew that there was a center for nonviolent communication, this is back in the early days of people being certified and as trainers, I just said, I'm going to be a certified trainer. I just, it was it's not like I decided it was decided for me. Yeah. <laughs> it's that kind of a decision, which are really the best decisions, you know, because you're, you're not wavering. It's a hundred percent. Yeah. This is what I have to do. Marshall's vision of world change. I found uh, our social change was very compelling as well. 
he really wanted this to be something that people could use towards social change. There seems to be a lot of auspicious timing in you picking up that book, having it land the way it did, and then having him come into town Mm -hmm. three weeks later, which set you on the path to becoming a certified trainer. It's like a very uh, magnetic type of quickening of your training. What did you experience from his being, you know, the, the being that he brought into the room? Because the videos of this guy are kind of mesmerizing. He, he has, are. his eyes are super intense and, yeah. and piercing, but he's kind of like slouched in a chair with two puppets on his hands, talking back and forth. <laughs> and he's funny. Like he, he says funny things. He uses yeah. a lot of poetry in his books and teachings. What did you experience of his presence when, when he started kind of getting into his teachings? There were a few things. There was the sincerity that I mentioned earlier mm-hmm. and uh, his his humor. For myself, I was hugely intimidated. That's not an uncommon response. I mean, suddenly someone is is before you and you know there's something that's that's different that's going on there. And because it's about language, the next thing you know, I'm afraid to speak now. Uh-huh. You know? <laughs> yeah. I, I remember the the first international intensive training that I went to, which is a nine day residential training. And when people would break up into groups and and go and practice together, I basically just closed my mouth for the entire time. You know that, that that's an exaggeration, but it's it's pretty close to it in the sense that I was learning more from just listening. I needed to hear a lot of it first before I ventured into speaking. So to be around him was to have a lot of ideas shattered yeah. about things that we thought. I've always been interested in human beings. As I said earlier, uh, cultural anthropology is something that I've studied, history, uh, because I'm you know, always wondering, how do we get where we are? There's a lot of things, and it's a slow process. You know, It's really quickening now. Um, but how did we get here? And he was somebody who had also investigated those things, and he was, he was articulate in a way that I was not. Yeah. And, uh, you know, in a way that I'm still trying to uh, gain some skillfulness in is to be articulate around the, uh, I'll call it the art of observation, which is the first step of the NVC process. I just wanted to acknowledge my own nerves now in this conversation with you because you've done so much of this work. How many workshops, if you had a ballpark, have you taught on this oh. subject since meeting Marshall and doing that work? I really don't. I've lost count. Certainly hundreds of workshops, thousands of people. This year, not so many workshops. Now I'm trying to bring things online, which I am slowly doing. Uh, You know, and it's remarkable to have people write to me years later. I don't even remember them. I don't know who they are. They, They would have spent two days with me. And to tell me that 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 workshop was life changing, which is really speaks more to them than it does to me. I introduce something, but the real work comes in. Are you going to do it? Yeah. That's where it comes in. I do say that at a workshop. Look, this can just be an interesting weekend for you. Or you can turn it into a labor of love for yourself Mm. and a gift to others. What I noticed about your website, and this is probably what prompted me to call you and leave you a message about it, was I really sense the extreme sense of uh, mission you have for the work, that even the pandemic couldn't really sideline you from it. You were going to get the medicine out one way or another. So there's... (laughs) You know, a whole slate of different coaching offers, tons of killer free resources. Uh, We'll share that in the show notes. I'd say my biggest underlying question for this whole conversation is how do we practice? Because I'm intimidated by the process. Mm -hmm. I have three small children at home who are starting homeschooling uh, for this year. The amount of conflicts that could happen. It's like permutations times a thousand when you have five personalities in one under one roof all home at the same time, all the time. I'm curious about your life pre-NVC as a mom and post-NVC. I'd love to hear how you applied it as a parent because I'm at the stage of very conscious incompetence, (laughs) I would call it. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) You you know, where it's on loudspeaker, like, wow, there's so many things that I could be saying and doing and practicing Mm -hmm. that the moments just slip on by and I, I feel like I'm failing. So um, I'd, I'd love to hear your experience of that as a mom of young kids learning these tools. I really hate to disappoint you, uh, but I, I can't say that things got hugely better after starting to learn nonviolent communication. 
but they also did get better. They got better, certainly. My understanding of what was going on, the conversations between myself and my children, even my son actually went to a workshop with Marshall. Oh, wow. He was 16 at the time. And, and I said, hey, Dylan, would you like to spend a day with Marshall? And he thought it was a great day. I can't say 100% how much of it he has taken in. Certainly he's absorbed mm -hmm. some of it. But I want to point out here that when it comes to parenting, there's so many factors that influence our children. And parenting, I think, is one small part of it. The culture is huge. I don't know what a parent does these days, for instance, around smartphones, around the digital technology. Yeah. How do you, you know, having that conversation, um, the saying of it takes a village to raise a child I think is a very true thing. Um, and for better or for worse, the village or or the, the environment is raising your child. Some of the arguments that happen between parents and children are not so much about what's going on between the two of them, but what's going on culturally around yeah. them. You know, if we go back before industrial revolution or when people were actually living more communally, people would have shared values. And now when people don't share the values, a lot of the conflict occurs around these things. So just to know that is very useful. And then to know how to speak about it is really, really helpful. And there is a point where I think it does rub off on the kids. I would put it this way. Kids would probably have a better sense of being heard and understood by their parents who are in deep practice of NBC. Mm -hmm. Hopefully that's what it would be. There'd yeah. be a, a, an, a level of openness that would be there, provided the child is also interested in having that. Mm -hmm. it, it depends on where the child is at when the parent has is learning this, whether there's already a, a lot of, you know, is, is there a lot of armoring that's already occurred, whether with the parent or with the school or the culture, what have you? It's very complicated is what I'm trying to say. So, uh, um, you know, I'm going to answer your question about these four steps. But before I go to that, I want to talk about the steps of alienating communication mm -hmm. that we have learned. And Marshall was very insightful in pointing that out. So I stress in my workshops, I stress more than anything, the ways people disconnect, because if all I do is provide them with a model where they get to speak about their needs in a positive way, but yeah. they superimpose that, overlay that on a template of alienating right. thinking, then I'm not doing anybody any favors. I'm just helping people deliver a separating message in a nice way. To clarify on this a little further for people that are new to this, by, by alienating language, you're talking about stuff that keeps holds us separate from one another, escalates things, maybe even when we don't mean to, but the things that we include in our communication that makes it us versus the other rather than we're in this together. Yeah, it creates a lot of enemy images. And I'll get very clear about what, what those are. So the first one would be diagnosis. So when we don't like what's happening, we diagnose. We think in terms of good, bad, right, wrong, appropriate, inappropriate, normal, abnormal. Uh, the person is selfish, manipulative, bossy, controlling. We use that kind of language. And even the the language of, you know, you're brilliant, you're beautiful, all of those, what they do is they put one person in the judger's seat and the other person is being judged. We're, we're not so bothered by the positive ones that, mm -hmm. that come our way. It doesn't mean you're being judged. Sometimes though, somebody will say something positive to you and you do get the sense of, it's something weird about it. I can't quite put my finger on it. I have a sense of being judged. Can't It doesn't feel like a heartfelt expression of joy or celebration. It's something else. So it's that kind of language where we're judging. And there's a kind of rigidity, I would say, around it often. This is not to say that there aren't things that are good or bad or right or wrong. It's simply that, that that's the only language that you have available to you to speak about it. Get ready because the other person will become defensive. Yeah. And as soon as that shows up, it erodes the what I would call the natural goodwill that people have 
to cooperate and collaborate together. I would say that's innate because it's part of our survival as a species. We're social creatures. We do need each other in order to survive. So we want to be in cooperation, collaboration, but as soon as somebody goes to that language, that alienated language, we're on the defensive and, and it could escalate. Could, yeah. could we couch this in a uh, very common scenario that just about everybody I know is dealing with? To use your, your earlier example, w- there's a child who's on the phone and all of a sudden we're judging that phone time is too much. Yes. And w- we're likely to walk in and say, Hey, get off your phone. You've been on it for two hours. Mm -hmm. And with the implied judgment of, you know, that, however, that that's too long, I think it could be helpful to, to hear how, how you might approach that from a, uh, from a neutral standpoint when we get there. But is, is that, is that an example of alienating language? It's the fact that we're thinking what they're doing is wrong and they shouldn't be doing that. The way Marshall would teach us would be, he'd say, no, no, what they're doing, that's the most wonderful thing in the world that they could be doing. And it's the most wonderful thing because it's meeting a need. The need is the wonderful thing. Perhaps the strategy isn't the best strategy to meet the need. Are we talking about some someone scrolling? How how is the phone being used? You yeah, know, I'm going to guess that qual- it's quality over quantity conversation. Yeah, but mostly what's driving people, I believe, to use phones is the the need for a connection or maybe the need for aliveness. It's a very, and I don't think it's a great strategy because people also report increased sense of disconnection and loneliness using the very device that they had thought or was promised that they would feel increased connection. So yes, there are moments when there are there's increased connection. Mm-hmm. So you're looking at here a strategy versus the need. So the need is for connection. So as the parent coming into the room, that's what I will uh, have on the tip of my tongue. I'm guessing that this is something that is fulfilling on some level, or you're hoping it will fulfill your needs for connection. Mm. Would that be the case? You start to have a conversation about it. Maybe sit down and watch The Social Dilemma on yeah. Netflix with them. I mean, I would encourage that. If yeah. they have a device, I would be sitting down and watching that. I'm taking on that homework, teacher. Mm-hmm. And um, just let me know how to submit my summary paper afterwards. But I'll do that with my teenage daughter because I feel like we, <laughs> we both need it. And so you want to have a conversation that focuses on the needs that are are being fulfilled and also that maintains the relationship. Yeah. That's what you want to be doing. You, you, we can even ask the question, you know, kids are totally open to this or teens. You know how I feel about that device. You know that I have fear in me. I, I'm afraid because I have a need for your well-being, for your mental well-being, your, for your physical well-being. And so, uh, and then there's information that's out there informing us that it isn't the best thing for us. So I get scared when I see you on it. And I'm wondering how you feel when you hear me say that. Or I'm wondering if you have any ideas about how we could talk about it. Mm. How do you feel when you hear this? Yeah. See, So you're moving it into a different place rather than naming it as this is a bad thing and you shouldn't be doing it. I, we have a rule, da, da, da. You know? I hear that as... Um using the phone in that scenario as a, a gateway into talking about the relationship versus using the phone as something to beat each other up over or dismiss one another or judge one another over. Mm-hmm. And if it's not the phone, it's how we eat or how well <laughs> while we're spending our time or who we're hanging out with. There's a, there's a million opportunities. Yeah. Back to the other three alienating forms of communication. And they all interconnect. Yeah. So the first one is diagnosing, diagnosing. The second yeah. one is demanding. So you would say you're not, you know, don't be on the phone. Get off the phone. You, you yeah. get off. Okay. The third is denial of personal responsibility. Every time I see you on the phone, you make me angry. This is denial of personal responsibility. No, the reason we're angry is because we have needs. There are things that we cherish, things that are important to us. And when someone else behaves in a way that becomes a stimulus for, you know, and activates that need, then then we can become angry, sad, or or happy, depending on what it is. Um, And then the third is deserve thinking, punishment and reward. So if I see you on that again, you won't be allowed. I'll take it away from you for a week. There you go. How's that? So this is 
you know, that's wrong. It's going to kill your brain. Get off of it. Um, it. It makes me sick and you can't have it for a week. There you go. I just enacted all of those four things. Playing the part of bad dad right now, it's Rochelle Lamb. That, those are the things that I go to because those are the languages that were taught growing up. Command and control, old school, short of ripping it out of their hand, whatever. You're trying to do that with words. And, and, it, and it feels so poisonous as you do it. You, you hear your parents or whoever taught, conditioned you that way, and you want to retract the words as soon as they come out. You, know, you, you could tell they're not effective. Where do we go from there on the positive side? And, and one of the things I've heard you say that I love is that the, the nuance of this is that is to practice applying the the framework or the formula or the four steps without sa- sounding so formulaic because people will mm-hmm. want to punch you if they hear you talking all the time about yeah they'll just see you as being manipulative i'm going to answer that question but i'd like to also share a, a poem that marshall wrote for his son it was a song he used to he would travel with uh, his guitar and he'd he'd sing songs and this one touches on just, you know, the, the parenting scenario that I think oh, awesome. uh, I think you'll really enjoy yeah. it. So it's called Song from Brett. And at the time, Marshall's son, Brett, was 16 years old. And it goes like this. If I clearly understand you intend no demand, I'll usually respond when you call. But when you come across like a high and mighty boss, you'll feel like you ran into a wall. And when you remind me so piously about all the things you've done for me, you better get ready. Here comes another bout. Then you can shout, you can spit, moan, groan, and throw a fit. I still won't take the garbage out. Now, even if you should change your style, it's going to take me a little while before I can forgive and forget. Because it seems to me that you didn't see me as human, too, until all your standards were met. Bam. Did he include the BAM or was that uh, your interpretation? That's me. And that's your- <laughs> I did. Wow. <laughs> no, because it's a very powerful illustration of, of what happens between human beings, you know, and you can just ask the question, can you imagine that this, this is what we end up doing when yeah. we could be doing the other thing of making life wonderful? And I'm not meaning that we're happy all the time. I mean that we can be enriching our lives and the lives of others on the planet and enriching life itself, which is something that I, uh, I like to stress a lot. I think that the, there's a parallel between the degradation, get degradation of the, what the resources on the planet or the planet, the life on the planet, the non-human life on the planet and our own, mm. that they're, they're, they're deeply intertwined. And uh, if we don't take care of life, you know, then, we're living in increased separation from life, and this is symptomatic. A lot of the conflicts are symptomatic, not of people's uh, poor behavior or poor speech, but of living in a crazy time. What I'm hearing there is that if we can't handle ourselves and the people that we are closest to with you know, love and openness and respect and, and, and honoring their humanity— how are we supposed to be entrusted with the planet or the ecosystem or the people that work for us or the businesses? And and I want to get to the opportunity here because it's almost too much grief to be with. I get sad over how I handled things last week or yesterday versus the promise of what's to come. And are are a lot of the the transformations that you witness in the workshops, are they those moments where people finally get through that and they make the different choice? Is the transformation possible from, you know, now forward, or is there a lot of healing and past regressions we have to clean up first? You mentioned the word grief, which is one I'd really like to spend a little bit of time with. I remember somebody asking Marshall in a workshop, what's it going to take to really change everything? So now the question was less about our personal relationships, but just everything. And Marshall responded, he said, uh, mourning, a lot of mourning. Yeah. And that seems to be something we're in a real hurry to either avoid or, or we just want to avoid or we're in a hurry to get through it. I'm not in a hurry to get through it because I, I think that's a very rich and fertile place. I think maybe one of the problems that we've been too 
oriented towards solution. Mm. And in the NVC model, you've got observation, feelings, needs, request, and solutions are in the request area. Maybe we we go too fast to that. Yeah. Maybe we should be spending more time really in that place of grief and looking at how many needs have not been met and start doing the work of meeting needs, but not just human needs. The, the lang- there's a language, too, uh, that we use. We speak about natural resources. But, you know, resources, that's already right. to objectify. It's commodifying. You know, yeah. yeah. And an and indigenous understanding is, you know, you point to the forest and say, those are my relatives. What you call resources, I call relatives. Right there, I think, is vital that we learn that the way we have been treating life and the world around us has also made it easy for us to use the language of human resources. And watching that, you know, recent documentary on the social dilemma where there's, they talk about users. Right. And the only time apparently that 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 word is used is with addiction. Users. Addiction. So, and it's almost like being an addiction being created for you, which is what a lot of technological devices do to us. So there's a lot of dehumanization going on with with language and a lot of heavy circumstances. And I feel like we're living through, hopefully most of us are, the the embodiment of this right now in in the rhetoric. And I, I, I was a student of rhetoric, my degree is in rhetoric. And whatever's happening now doesn't even feel like rhetoric because it, it it doesn't have any flowery language. It doesn't have any respect for the other. It's not it's not even, you know, packaged in civility of any type. It's just it's hate in a lot of ways. And um you, you know, almost using those those four alienated languages as a device on purpose. Mm-hmm. So in in that type of environment, what what transformation um, could be possible for us? You know, in uh, at, at the individual, does it have to start on the everybody's individual level? I, I don't have answers for that. Uh, it's it's we're in too deep. I think anyway, we're in too deep. What I try to do is do my best to remain human. To try to remain human. There's so much that goes on. There's so much separation that is normalized. Right now, a lot of kids are, they're not in school or their school is now being done online. This is a great time to read a book that Marshall Rosenberg had recommended at almost every single workshop I ever went to. And it was called Dumbing Us Down, The Hidden Curriculum of Compulsory Schooling by John Taylor Gatto. And in that book, John Taylor Gatto was an award-winning school teacher uh, in New York City. He speaks about, he makes the distinction between what teachers uh, believe they're teaching, but what they're actually teaching. Yeah. And uh, he cites things like um, what they're teaching is uh, confusion, or what they're teaching is indifference, uh, what they're teaching is that uh, rank and status. Uh, so it's a very powerful book. And I think at this particular time, we could be asking ourselves, what, what do people need to know now? What do our children need to know? Because I would suggest that the curriculum would be different um, yeah. now. Um, you know, reading, writing, and arithmetic, they don't take a long time to teach. Right. Uh, they, they really don't. So, uh, but, but the rest of it, what can we imagine? You know, I, I can't, I don't know if you can, I have grandchildren now. I have a four-year-old grandson and uh, yeah, he'll be four in a few days. And I have a two-year-old granddaughter, um, which is a weight for me to think about their future right now. I got to say it does, you know, I get choked up thinking about it. What is the world going to look like 20 years from now? I can assure you it will not look like what the world looked like when I was 24. There's no way it's going to look like that. Yeah. And I have no idea what it would look like. What does somebody need to know? I don't know. 
And I don't trust anybody who says they know. I would trust somebody, though, who would say, well, I think the basics would be good. Do you know how to grow food? Do you know how to honor life? Hmm. Do you know how to, uh, you know, gather people and work with other people? And so, yeah, and solve problems together. Yeah. yeah. Do you know how to do those things? And I think some kind of reform of the education system, it could happen now. But instead, mostly what's happening is people are upset that their kids can't go to school. Well, they're looking and, for they're yeah. looking more for the daycare aspect of it. They than are. They are for the edu- than their kid getting educated. And, and I think that's the stress right now with our three kids at home today. What is the quality? What are they talking about? But the... Um, I would trust you, Rochelle, more than most to uh, tell us what we're missing because I almost, I almost think that that MVC could be a language that that we learn or introduce a little earlier, like the the phonics of things, like the pieces of grammar. Because discovering this in my forties, you know, I've I've heard about it for years, but to to really be at a an inflection point where it just it, it is the way. It's very clearly clearly the way. How would you recommend introducing these things? And, and is somebody ever too young to learn the basics of the, the four steps? I don't think anybody's ever too young because I think that uh, what Marshall was talking about was something that is innate in human beings. You could put it this way. You have a choice. You can either contribute to life or you can make life challenging. And which one would you choose? So it's our, I think we, we could all say that we do better when, when we're working collaboratively together and when we know that what we're doing is enriching to each other and enriching to life itself. Here's a question I have when I'm speaking to people. I say, uh, so did you learn to speak before you learned to think? And uh, yeah, you did. Where did you learn the speaking? You learned it from your caregivers and your speaking shapes your thinking. You're being taught how to see. If I point to the forest and I say, there's your relatives and you're four years old. That's very different than if I point and say, there's the resources and I have a big bulldozer beside me and you're four years old, you're learning the world right then and there. At least the way that I approach nonviolent communication, and I, I have other, you know, uh, teachers, or um, I've, I've learned in other places as well. As I said, uh, the cultural anthropology, I'm very intrigued with the fact that there are people living on the planet, there's few and fewer and fewer of them now, but they're mostly tribal indigenous peoples. They've lived a certain way for thousands of years, unchanged. And their way of life honors that place where they live. They're of the place. They don't have landfills. They're not trash in the place, right? But so, so there's something that happens to people that would put them on that path. I don't think people are, are, born evil or that they're, it, it, they're not evil, it, but ignorance to things uh, can have us do evil things. So that four-year-old, you know, grows up differently depending on what you've heard and uh, what's been said to you. So a nonviolent communication, at least um, what it does is it starts pointing people in the direction of needs that are life serving. What serves life? Now, I do see a tendency in the NVC world to make the, to, to focus mostly on humans. I prefer not to do that. Um, because after 20 years of doing this, I'm not convinced that it it doesn't change how we are around the world. I think I think we need it to be pointed out to us. I think the fact that we weren't initiated into adults, uh, the inner child, and the please satisfy me. I want to be comfortable. I want things. Uh, I want to be happy. I want all of this is part of that. Whereas nobody ever pulled me aside when I was 18 and said, "Hey, um, 
you know there's a world around you and that it's a non-human world and everything that shows up on your plate every day, it does so by virtue of the efforts of other people and a whole alive world. And you want to have a family one day, don't you? Uh, yes, I do. And you want them to be able to have a family one day? Yes, I do. Then you're going to have to think bigger than what you want right now. And so the needs very quickly can contract and become super personal. I, I'm trying to stretch it out because I'm also trying to be faithful to what Marshall had in mind uh, around social change. I had a conversation with him one day where I said, Marshall, you know, I was just kind of gushing with my love for him and saying, oh, thank you so much for, you know, for showing us this way for, you know, deep personal transformation and so forth. And I'll never forget how he responded to me. I was embarrassed. And I, this was back in the days of me being very intimidated. And he just looked at me with that face that you said you, you know, you mentioned, you can see it on YouTube, the dark eyebrows, the dark eyes. And he just said, uh, I really hope people will use this for social change. That's how I want people to use it. It, it almost sounds like the that fundamental tension between, uh, I mean, so perfectly captured by Mick Jagger and the Rolling Stones, you can't always get what you want, but sometimes <laughs> yeah. you find you, you might find you get what you need. But the, 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 the fundamental difference between wants and needs, like wants and desires, and, and I, I've had a problem with like all of this personal space spiritual development, quote unquote, around desires, because in yoga, we're taught that desires are maybe not always good. You know, they're, they, they lead us forward, they're expansive, but they can very well come at the expense of other people's needs. And, and I think that's what I hear at the core of nonviolent communication is the, the time it takes and the care it takes to really hear somebody else's needs, including expressing your own uh, because we, we're so quick to, or we're taught to skip over that part where we, we, you know, go to bed each night with our needs unfulfilled. Mm -hmm. Just kind of coming full circle here, what would you recommend would be a starting point for somebody listening who wants to take the first step, the next step? And, you know, obviously they should pick up Marshall's, you know, uh, classic book, Nonviolent Communication. But uh, what resources would you recommend or steps that they take with you? to further their training, deepening their practice? Um, well, I have a free resource page and I do have, uh, a, yeah, quite a few things on my website that are available. I also do one-on-one -on -one, uh, sessions with people. I have a couple of online courses that are going on right now um, and a new course opening up, you know, in a couple of months from now. That's available to people. And there's so much on, on YouTube too. If people look up Marshall Rosenberg. In particular, there's one called Making Life Wonderful, where uh, Marshall is speaking to a group of probably about 50, 60 people. And it's over the course of, I think, two days. I believe there's about six hours of videotaping there. I think it's important to get a sense of the man and you know, he wasn't simply offering a way for people to feel good. That's also in there. Yeah. Um, but he was really offering, a, from my perspective, a way for people to see more clearly. We're all in this together. And this is, this is hard. This is rough. It's really hard to know how to be human, uh, especially when we have been distracted away from it. Being forced to be at home now, it forces us to actually see what has always been there, but we've been um, avoiding it or not having to look at it. And so here it is. So my takeaway for everyone listening is don't just make another run to the Home Depot and get more crap to fix up your house. Work on your relationships. <laughs> They've all been waiting for us to, to tend them properly. And there's so much opportunity and so much joy there. Well, Rochelle, thank you once again, and uh, I can't wait to have you back for a follow-up once I've had more time to practice. Yeah, it's it's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much, Christopher, and I hope that anybody who's listening has also been touched in some way that would have them want to learn more about this extraordinary work. Thank you so much for listening. If you found this useful, please, by all means, share it. 
can find us everywhere online at This Epic Life. And you can hop over to Apple Music and leave us a much appreciated review.